Podcast hosting provided by Transistor. If you want to host your own show, head over to Transistor.fm and start a 14-day free trial. Hello, Engineeric Time of the Day. This is Regen, the e-racing podcast. I'm your host, Dino, and I'm here with a man who's joining me from Bern in a small hotel room, Chris Salsby. How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good, you know. It's it's hot over here, mind. It's very warm. But Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, it's warm. It's 25 degrees. Okay. So I'm assuming that that's Celsius, like, like the same yes. people. Yes, degrees C. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, I've probably just offended most of our listeners because they're from the US, but moving right along. Uh, now, you also have a degree. I do. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. What, what, did, you, what did you study, just quickly? So I was at uh, Oxford Briggs University uh, studying communication, media and culture. I've been doing that for the past three years alongside everything else that I do, and on Monday last week, I finally finished. So congratulations! Can't yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Hard work. Yes, uh, it a lot of hard work, but job done really. Yeah, um, I have a a marketing degree from Lincoln University. But very nice. So, mm, and then, yes, it's it's not an easy thing to to gain. No, it's a, it's constant uphill battle, really. But it is, it is. Okay, uh, moving into the show, I just wanted a shout out on Huzu Graphics on Twitter. He's doing some artwork for the show, which can be seen in the, uh, I guess, the episode picture for our show, and it is the city that we're racing in and the winning car. Check him out, he's on Instagram as well. Um, Yeah, really good job. Watch out for that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Very nice. It uh, is very, very cool. Yeah. I've also been on the e-talking from e-motion podcast with Stuart Garlic, and that was pretty fun. It was about the, well, mostly about the calendar for season six and the changes that are, well, upcoming. And we're also going to talk about that shortly. Um, but yeah, go and check out that show. It can be found anywhere where you listen to podcasts. Just type in e-talking from e-motion. Okay, media of the week. I'll let you do some talking, Chris. What do you got? So my, uh, again, I forgot to do my media of the week, but my choice is a film called Black Klansman. Uh, so I watched this film called Black Klansman last week, and it's a biographical uh, crime film. Uh, it's set in Colorado Springs in the 1970s, and it's actually, it's actually well, it's, it's a true story, and it's about uh, an African-American detective called Ron Stallworth who is seeking to infiltrate and expose the local Ku Klux Klan group. It's quite good. That is that is pretty cool. I definitely will put some links in the show notes. Well, it's, yeah, I might put some links in the show notes. We'll see. Yeah, it's interesting. It's got uh, John David Washington in, who was in a TV show called Ballers, if you've heard of it. It's a comedy. No, I haven't. Yeah, we've got Adam Driver in that as well, who's obviously, yeah. It's been in loads, so. What's your uh, media of the week? Formula 2 has a podcast called The Road to F1. I'm not sure if I've added in this one before, but I'm going to do it again. It is an awesome podcast, so check that out, especially if you're a Formula 1, Formula 2 fan and want to see all of the talent that's upcoming through those uh, lower categories. There is also a new podcast, a new-ish podcast, by the team at Outlap F1 Podcast. And they are from Chicago, so they're an American um, set of fans. Really good analysis, and I've been speaking with them back and forth on Twitter. They're really approachable, and I think I said it a few a few podcasts ago that I listen to a lot of F1 and Formula E podcasts. And you do get some similarities between what's happened on the racetrack and... Um, but you do get some awesome opinions and differing differing opinions um, and challenges on that. Everything um, and all of the podcasts are, are different in that way. So go and check it out. 
I, I fully recommend it. And hopefully, hopefully we can do some crossover. Maybe we might be able to go on their podcast. They might be able to come on here. Um, and yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, we'll have a look at that, definitely. Something to look into. Yeah, I've got another one, but I'll save it for next time. It's it's an interesting sort of interesting sort of TV show, but we'll save that for next time. <laughs> uh, alrighty, into the news. The World Rallycross for 2020, uh, Electric as a Support Series. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to check this one out, Chris. Oh, I haven't. All uh, right. What they're looking at doing is having a support series as opposed to the World Rallycross going electric. The manufacturers couldn't agree, and so there's going to be some that are um, going to be supporting similar to the likes of the IPACE E Trophy to the World Rallycross. So that's quite cool. Uh, that's interesting because I know the, uh, the World Rally Cross Championship was supposed to go fully electric, but that got scrapped last year, I think. Correct. Yeah. At least they're making steps towards that sort of uh, future. But um, yeah. Now, Virgin, Bird and Frames, they will be retained at Virgin for next season. And to me, this is this is good. I'm I'm happy about that, but also it sort of negates the speculation of Sam Bird potentially going to Audi. So we we wanna wanna sort of see where that one goes. But yeah, Bird and Frames they are staying at Virgin. Yeah, solid signing right there by Virgin. I'm glad that both of them are staying on. Both of them are spectacular drivers. Frames has done such a good job this year. And long, I mean, Bird's had some poor luck along the way, but he's he's done a very good job recently. Well, recently earlier in the season as well but yeah i'm happy about that good i think you're probably not alone in that fact as well okay the 19 and 20 calendar for formula e provisionally have you seen this calendar and what are your thoughts chris yeah i've seen the calendar um it's just a bit bland really oh okay i'm not i mean it's okay, so we start off in Adria, which is fair enough. But a lot earlier than usual. So we start on November twenty second. The November twenty second race is actually a Friday, and it looks like that might be the proposed night race potentially. Yes, um, that would be the, cool. The TBC, no one knows, but I've heard Marrakesh. And then we go to Santiago, Mexico City, Hong Kong, fair enough. Back into China, don't know where. And then the European leg starts, very samey. We've got South Korea slapped just right bang in the middle of that, which isn't fair miles. No. Um, but I'm happy we're going to London. Yes, I'm, I'm thinking I'll try and get over to London, actually. Um, it's everything, like I said in the e-talking from emotion podcast, everything is very expensive flying from New Zealand, but if it was going to be one on the calendar that, um, I would get to, and especially because it's a double header, um, that would be the one for me. Yeah, I would agree. I would say London's probably the standout round for next season in all honesty. Yeah. And the Excel center that's, you know, it's got the indoor section, I think. One race you could be indoors, and uh, the other you can have a different vantage point. So I think it's quite exciting, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's definitely a cool track because it runs both indoors and outdoors, the Air London circuit. It's still uh, subject to homologation, obviously, but it looks it looks like it's a really cool, really cool circuit. And that'll be fantastic to end the season on, you know. it's uh, Especially for me, you know, it's coming home, so to speak. But, oh, let's not start that, eh? Uh, it's coming home. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, Berlin. We have sort of heard that there might be a change in layout. Um, now, the Berlin track is it's at Tempelhof Airport. It is made, um, so I guess they're pretty free to be able to change it. And like I, like I said, it can grow... Um, and and they can sort of morph around what the cars are doing speed wise and how big they are and yeah your thoughts on Berlin? Yeah, um, I would. I mean, I like the venue of the Berlin circuit. I think it's fantastic that it's on the Tempelhof uh, Airport. 
Um, purely because it does give Formula E that flexibility to change the track layout. And we've been racing in Berlin since season one now. And the Tempelhof Airport's have loads of races, but I think it might be time for that change. Um, just, you know, a little tweak, really. I know um, Turn 6 has changed over the years. And uh, this year they did away with a tunnel out of Turn 3. But, you know, I would like to just, you know, spice it up a bit. And because it is an open space, they will have the freedom to do that, obviously. And that that's, you know, exciting. I mean, especially with the Gen 2 car as well, because the Gen 2 is so much faster than the Gen 1 car. It's probably time to, you know, lengthen the circuit slightly and, you know, make that lap time a little bit longer. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I'd be welcome to that. For sure. I think anything that sort of makes the the racing more exciting is, uh, yeah, it's okay in my book. Yeah, exactly. Now, is there any other news that you'd like to address, uh, like the article that you wrote on the iPACE e-trophy? Yes, there is some more news I would like to address, Dino. Oh, brilliant. Funnily enough, the IPC trophy. Uh, <laughs> so um, for those of you who subscribe to Motorsport Monday or just read it, uh, you'll know fine well that recently I did a magazine feature on the Jaguar IPC e trophy. And if you haven't uh, read this, why not? Uh, the feature in question is a car tour of the IPC Trophy car. It's a cockpit tour, dashboard tour. It's, you know, if you're feeling particularly adventurous on a Formula E weekend, you could read this article, probably go into the IPC Trophy paddock and start the thing and drive away in it. That's how extensive it is. Yeah, I'm very happy with it. And, you know, you should definitely read it because it is, uh, it's a proper technical insight feature, which I don't do often. Uh, Also, Pending news, soon to be released today, funnily enough, or tomorrow, or yesterday when you listen to this, or earlier in the week. Well, um, yeah, okay, we're recording on the 24th, so, <laughs> yeah. Just, so, yeah, uh, if you're listening to this, like, in 2020, it's already out. But, yeah, I've got an interview with Celia Martin uh, coming out today. No way. On the 24th. <laughs> so, cold. you're going to... Enjoy that. It's um, four double page spreads. Brilliant. Enjoy. Whenever we record the podcast, just before, like right before, I get a little notification on my phone that Motorsport Monday is in my email inbox, ready to be read. And I'm looking forward to this one. So any um, sort of indication as to whether Celia will be on the grid next season? You'll have to read the final paragraph of the feature. Okay, we'll go straight there. Yeah. But but first, uh, the reason that we do this podcast, uh, Formula E and the Burn E Pre qualifying. Did you watch the qualifying? I did watch the qualifying. Brilliant, because I was at a, a family thing and missed it. So how dominant was Jean-Éric Verne? Going into Burn this weekend, the Estachita did have a very... It was clear that they had the advantage over the rest of the field. So uh, Verne set the fastest time in free practice one, and uh, the DS Tachita cars were second and third in FP2. Um, Obviously, Verne was in group one and was by far the fastest runner of that group and was able to secure himself a spot inside of Super Bowl and ended the group qualifying stages as the second fastest driver. Um, he was joined in Super Bowl by Sam Bird, Max Gunther, Pascal Verlein, Buemi, and Mitch Evans. So it was a, it was a real shake-up, so we had uh, runners from all four groups in the Super Bowl shootout. But um, the lap that Vern delivered was stunning. He completely knocked Buemi's lap time out of the ballpark, uh, 0.35 seconds clear. And Mitch Evans, who was the final runner in Super Bowl, was just, well, unable to challenge, really, and he was still three-tenths down. So it very much was advantage Verne in the session. Good, concise sort of um, wrap-up of, of what happened. Uh, now, we we look down the list, and we see in 20th, Antonio Felix da Costa. What happened to him? Because he's normally nowhere near that sort of that sort of position. So, 
it was a Group One thing, from what I understand. We had Antonio Felix da Costa twentieth, Lucas de Grassi nineteenth, uh, and they were only faster than the Neo guys. Uh, also in Group One, Andre Lotter qualified in eighth, and Robin Franz was only ninth. So, yeah, I just think yeah. it was a Group One thing. In all honesty, they, they struggled to get a lap together, and when they did, it was you're just a bit rubbish, really. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Again, Group One. Um, okay, moving moving right along. We'll move into the race. The pile up at the start. D'Ambrosio flying in, destroying. Robin Frains, um, smashing into the back of him. Robin decides to go spinning, um, and then there's a bit of a pile up. Was it Gunter and uh, Pascal Verlein just got stuck and caused the roadblock? Any thoughts on uh, D'Ambrosio? Was he just trying to be a little bit optimistic or just couldn't get it stopped? Yeah, I think <sighs> the first corner for the Bernie Prix was very tight. So the first corner was the turn 12, 13, 14 chicane, which was always going to be a challenge to get through for 22 cars. And I think, well, D'Ambrosio did go in guns blazing and went into the back of Frines, and Frines spun across the track, slap straight into the wall and out the race. Then for Verline, he started in fourth, and he just kind of left the door open on Gunther, and it's quite difficult to see what happened looking at the replays. But I think he just kind of turned in and then spun slightly and just got, just blocked the entire track, really. But especially with D'Ambrosio, it was a very gung-ho jump in the car and jump into turn one and go flying, uh, race start from him, and it could have been more cautious. Uh, from 20th place, we saw Antonio Felix da Costa really uh, put the brakes on early for turn one purely because he probably knew that there was going to be an accident. Uh, look, going into the race, I know Pascal Verlaine actually said, you know, there's some tight there's some tight places on this burn track. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a red flag. And um, I just think it's quite funny that he caused it. <laughs> and the red flag was shown 54 seconds into the race. <laughs> but, yeah, carnage from the outset, really. It was a long race, wasn't it? Just due to the fact that they uh, they stopped for a wee while while they were backing out cars and clearing other cars, and um, bit of bit of uh, talk back to who was it? The stewards. There was a camera on Degrassi uh, who was less than impressed that he would be going back to near his starting position after making up quite a few places. Yeah, so uh, there was a lot of controversy with the race start. So obviously with the well, with the entire track blocked. Um, a lot of drivers weren't just going to sit there. So the, the rear of the field just kind of chopped through the escape road uh, to continue running. And Degrassi jumped from 19th to 8th on the race start. And uh, De Costa went up to 9th from starting in 20th. Then you had to team two Neo guys after that. And his argument was, from what I understand, he obviously cut the chicanes by taking the escape road. He stopped as he's supposed to. It was all very legal. And he continued, and they all took the timing line before the red flag was waved. He argued that because of that, and because they'd done an extra lap, they should therefore start in that position. But for restart procedures, when there's a red flag, the FIA take the on track timings of the last time that every driver is recorded in position. But obviously, because there was the big pile up, probably about over well, almost 60% of the field hadn't taken timing line. So therefore, they decided to restart it in grid order, which is actually regulation. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot to take in. But yeah. Yeah, it was just incredible. And. I mean, there could have been better places to start the race than um, that turn one chicane, for sure. And I I would give this track probably a five or six out of ten. Oh, really? It looked cool. It looked cool, but just apart from Bird, who seems to just get around people just ugh, like they're nothing, no one else could overtake. Yeah, yeah, not wrong, that's a thing. See, I, I walked the uh, 
I walked the track on Thursday. I don't know if you follow me on Instagram or Twitter, anyone listening, but you might have seen uh, my little track walk. And some of the aspects of this track were fantastic. And I mean, I was thinking at times, how the, how the hell are people going to fit through some of these corners? I remember saying that at turn seven, and that's where Mortara crashed into Sims in the race. Yeah, I mean, the thing is with this weekend as well, with the burn track, it was very last minute. So Formula E was supposed to be racing in Zurich this year, but because of some festival that was by the Lake Zurich, um, they had to change it to another city, and that was Bern. Bern's very small. <laughs> it's tiny. Uh, I, I, I saw that. Bern is so small. And the Formula E essentially took up all of the city. Um, the track itself wasn't directly in the city centre. It was just outside of it. But it ran through mostly, it mostly ran through a residential area. And then you had the fan zone in the Allianz E village running down the main street in Bern. Literally down the entire main street. So that led to, obviously, a lot of disruption for residents. And, yeah, a lot of animosity towards Formula E. Yes, I did see something that you had on, it would have been Twitter or for, um, or Facebook or Instagram, uh, about a bike. Yeah, so on Thursday after doing the track walk, I was, uh, I was walking around, uh, found the Parliament building, and there uh, were a bunch of people on bicycles protesting against Formula E, basically. and. I wouldn't be you know, a journalist if I didn't go and ask them some questions. So obviously I waddled into the pack uh, and used my really good acting skills and said, you know, what's Formula E? What's this about? <laughs> and I mean, a large, the, the, the main reason for people protesting was because um, of the disruption caused, uh, as opposed to the, the series. You know, the, they were very. They had a lot to say about the disruption of the race. But uh, when I said, "Oh, what do you think of Formula E?" all I would really get was just a uh, just a grunt and a tap of the forehead or something, or a shake of the head. So yeah. But afterwards, the cyclists went to uh, they drove around the track actually, or rode around the track anyway. But there were a lot of people there. I would say it was probably about five hundred people protesting. Oh, so, so not a small group. No, it wasn't a small group. There were a lot of bikes. A lot of bikes. Well, they may not have something to protest about next season, so we will, uh, yeah, wait and see on that one, unfortunately. Yeah, but sadly. I, think, I thought Zurich was a really good track, actually. Um, and Burn with the beer pit, um, with the brown beers, pretty cool. But, you know, it, it, it was a cool location, but I just think, anyway, we'll move on. Okay, so. The race result, Jean-Eric Verne taking the win, uh, Mitch Evans in second, Sebastian Buemi in third, Sam Bird in fourth, Maxi Gunter fifth, Daniel Apps sixth, Alex Lynn seventh, Felipe Massa, Lucas Degrassi and Stoffel Van Dorn take out the top ten, and then you've got Da Costa, Sim, Stambrosio, Lotterer, we'll come back to him in a second. Uh, Dillman, Turvey, Paffitt, Roland. Uh, so from Roland, Verline, Mortara, Frains, and Lopez all did not finish. Uh, Lopez, because a disqualification, the rest a technical DNF. We'll start with uh, Lotterer. A, a swarm of penalties. And to be fair, they're pretty harsh. Yeah. Yeah. So Andre Lotterer handed a post-race time penalty uh, for this is yeah this is breach of Article Thirty Seven, um, which is a ignoring pit lane lights. He had a drive-through penalty, which converted into a post-race time penalty of twenty-two seconds, which demoting him down to about fourteenth, fifteenth pretty harsh considering that there was a red flag and he came in to change his front wing. Obviously Lotterer got this penalty post-race, 22 seconds, and he finished in 14th. Oh, what a shame, because he finished fourth. 
He finished fourth in the race, and he, he was in reach of Buemi to finish third. And him finishing in fourth moved him into second in the Drivers' Championship, 32 points behind Verne. And now he's dropped to fourth, over 40 points behind. Fair enough, he did ignore the pit lane lights, but uh, at this stage of the season, it's costly. You've got a, I mean, human error. You're not always thinking about those sort of things. Wins a red flag. And he, I mean, that was a great drive. It was. To get past Sam Bird, to force Sam Bird into a mistake was brilliant. I think he was probably the top overtaker, actually, in Bird, because he started in eighth. Um, he cleared uh, Verline because Verline obviously retired, but he then overtook Apt around the outside of turn seven, I think it was. Cleared Gunther and then got Sam Bird as well, and it was oh, it was fantastic, fantastic to watch. Mm, I didn't actually think about about Lotterer in my sort of post race driver of the day, but maybe he should be there. Yeah, I think I think he does deserve to be there certainly because. The, he was one of the only drivers who decided to risk it. I spoke to Lotter at post race, and he said, "You know, I just started off getting acquainted with the track and slicing people up. You know, I was just being really cautious, and then I started making the moves. And honestly, a fantastic drive from from Lotter. It was very impressive. Absolutely. Now we're going to talk about Dragon, and we're going to talk about Lopez disqualified, basically because." exceeding the maximum power usage of 200 kilowatts on lap 15. So yeah. too much, too much power, automatically gone. That's a shame. Yeah, yeah. So it's the, uh, he finished in 13th in the race and exceeded the 200 kilowatts uh, power maximum thing. And that's the same reason that DeCosta was disqualified from the race in Monaco. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And um, yeah, um, I'm thinking he's probably out the door after after the double header in New York, so I'm sure he's not too bothered. But um, yeah, to be fair, I, I don't think he'd want to drive for them again. In all honesty, no. Uh, and Venturi fined two thousand euros for a power overuse under Regen for both Felipe Massa and Mortara in FP1. Yeah, and Mortara also handed a five place grid penalty for New York after it was found that. He was responsible for an incident with Alexander Sims at turn seven. Yes, that one was a bit clumsy. Yeah, so uh, Mortara just, well, he just went in the side of Sims, didn't he? But he was actually, he was suffering from brake problems, to be fair. Uh, I was talking to someone from Venturi uh, just before qualifying, and they were saying, oh, you know, we've got some braking problems, we had it in practice one and practice two. But, you know, it should be resolved for qualifying in the race. Well, it wasn't, was it? No. No, Mortara hasn't had a very good rub of the green recently. Um, I don't think he's finished in the points since his win in uh, Hong Kong, has he? Oh, this is, I'm not sure, actually. You know who hasn't? If we go back to D'Ambrosio, he hasn't got points in the last four races. Yeah. A fall from grace, really, isn't it? And he was, you know, a title contender. Yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame because when Jerome got a third place in Adderia and won in Marrakesh, I mean, I was certainly thinking. I just, you know, I thought I would love to see Jerome D'Ambrosio fight for this this championship this season, and unfortunately, it hasn't manifested, has it? It hasn't. It's it's cut down the um, the contenders for sure in the last couple of races. Yeah, and yeah. Burn seems to be. He seems to be just streaking ahead. Not literally, but... Yeah, Vern, so Vern this season's been fantastic. I think it's probably the best he's ever driven. To get this title and to be to be driving like this, I think it's the best he's ever driven. You know, I would, I would agree with that, I think. I would agree with that. Because if you think back to the start of the season, this season Vern also equaled his worst run of form in Formula E. Yeah, believe it or not, Earlier this season, Verne equaled his worst run of form in Formula E. But since mm. then, he's been consistently there or thereabouts. He's delivered in qualifying, even in difficult circumstances, in Group 1, when others have failed to Costa and Degrassi this weekend. He took his third win of the season. 
his third consecutive podium finish, to be able to turn around what seemed to be a difficult season at the start, to have a 32-point advantage in the championship with two races to go. It's it's very impressive. It's very impressive. And, you know, hats off to the guy at the end of the day. Um, before we go into the standings, driver of the day, I think mine is Mitch Evans. Um, any other track apart from Monaco, he probably would have overtaken Vern. Um, he just looked like he had so much pace that race. Yeah, Lotterer as well. Yeah, Mitch Evans did a fantastic job in, uh, in Bern. Stellar job. He he was much faster than Vern throughout, really. I know Vern was suffering from understeer throughout the race, but Evans was mighty. And there was only 0.16 seconds between them at the checkered flag, which might be actually the smallest winning margin in Formula E so far. Yeah, potentially. I'm, yeah, I'm potentially. Thinking back to uh, Verline running out of power and Degrassi just getting him, but ah, uh, yes. actually that that didn't um, that didn't actually. Um... Yeah, that didn't start because Verline had the penalty. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um. What else have you got written here, Max Gunther? Yes, Max Gunther is my driver of the day. It was. A very mature race from Maxi. Yeah. And 10 points. You know. Honestly, the. Oh, he did such a good job, didn't he? He uh, got that dragon car, which, well, it's not exactly fast, is it? No. He pulled it at the back in Group 4, got it the Super Pole, qualified in fifth. Fair enough. Fair enough. You know, but he's up there. And it's where he has to be on a circuit wood. It's where it's hard to overtake. And he only dropped, well, he finished in sixth. No, he finished in fifth. He well, finished he finished fifth. sixth, and then Lotterer yeah. got booted, but yes. Yeah, he finished sixth, promoted to fifth. Ten points in the bag. For a driver who is the youngest driver on the grid, probably arguably the least experienced on the grid as well because of that, and he arrived in Formula E, did three races, and Felipe Nasa was given the seat. Missed a couple of rounds, and then he was put back in on a race-by-race deal. And after all of the rubbish that he's had to deal with and wade through this season, to be able to still finish there, and of course completely outperform Lopez in every single aspect, it's it's very impressive. If Max Gunther doesn't get a drive next season, there's something wrong. Absolutely. Because the guy is so talented and... He deserves the drive. He does deserve a drive. My favourite part was uh, probably the entire weekend was when uh, Gunther qualified in fifth place. And we had uh, Jay Penske, who's the Dragon team boss uh, on the team radio. And he goes, Max, this is why we hired you. Well, why'd you take him out of the car? <laughs> exactly. This is why we hired you, fired you, rehired you, and put, we put you on a race-by-race race deal. But uh, what a mess! Well, well, it'd be interesting to see if they can keep him. If I was, if I was Porsche, I'd be giving him a call. To be honest, it's not a bad um, idea, actually. You know, they got Neil Yanni, and I mean, none of them are experienced, but you got to start somewhere. Yeah, that's not a bad idea, actually. Yeah, and I, I would say that you know he'd be cheaper than quite a few of the other drivers, so. Anyway, that's, that's just an idea. Yeah, that's the thing. No one knows about that Porsche seat, though. It's, uh, I mean, who does know, really? Harley's been testing the car, but that second driver remains anonymous. It's very exciting, especially because it could be Hartley, and then there'd be two Kiwis in the series. Yeah, exactly. And then, then let's hope TBC is Auckland. Nah, I'm just joking. Um, It'd be good if, if we'd race there, though. It'd be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it would be. Right, now, Jean-Éric Verne leads the way with 130 points in the standings. Lucas Degrassi is 32 points back on 98. Mitch Evans in third, 87. Lotterer, 86. De Costa, 82. Frains, 81. Apt, 75. Also, Buebi, 75. Sandbird, 68. And D'Ambrosio, 65. And then we've got Roland, Mortara, Verline. Um, Massa, Van Dorn, Sims. It's, it's 
I mean, Sims is down in 16th on 24 points. Maxi Gunther, 20. Alex Lynn, already got 10 points on the board. Uh, Gary Pafford on 8. Uh, 6 for Turvey, and then 3 for Lopez, 1 for PK. Dillman on nothing, as well as Nazza and Rosenquist. Any surprises there? Um, obviously, the standout name at the bottom of the table is Alexander Sims. He's the 16th. He has 24 points. And then compare that to teammate De Costa. Uh, De Costa has 82. That's a massive disparity. But Sims has had such an unlucky season. It's insane. He has. It's just been insane. It's crazy how much poor luck he's had. It's been knockback after knockback, or he's been involved in an incident that wasn't his fault, or wiped out by a Banzai driver at the back of the field. Even the standout one for me had to be Mexico City, so he was he was so much further up the road, and then Pique went sailing over the back of Verne and hit Sims in the chicane. Yeah, that was the, just... The chances of it. Uh, yeah. And again this weekend, you know, him getting hit by Mortara was definitely not his fault. It was a breaking issue for the Swiss Italian driver. But... Okay. Uh, the Constructors, DS to Cheetah, 216, Audi, 173, Virgin, 149, Nissan, 138, Mahindra, 117, BMW, 106, uh, 98 for Jaguar, Venturi on 88, uh, 39 for HWA, and Dragon 23, and Neo 6, and Neo hasn't scored a point since Hong Kong. Ouch. Yeah, it's been a hard season for Neo, hasn't it? It's so hard. But it looks like the car just gets worse <laughs> as the season progresses. But they've already started working on, a se- on their Season 6 car a couple of weeks ago at the start of the month. So, I mean, fingers crossed they'll be able to turn something around. Yeah. Now, the question is, uh, Diaz de Cheetah is the Constructors Championship leader and John Eric Verne is the Drivers Championship leader. Are we going to see Diaz de Cheetah take both this season? I think the Drivers Championship is pretty much decided. Vern isn't a driver who drops the ball. He doesn't really make mistakes. And he's very much in championship mode. He's been saying that he refuses to think about the championship until it's all over. Um, But he will take the same approach going into New York. He will head there aiming to win. And he expects Diaz de Chita to do the same, basically. He goes, I want to approach this like we're still at the start of the championship and still fighting for everything. Um, and I think that's probably the best mindset to head into this. Obviously, in the team's championship, DS to Cheetah have that advantage. But it'll be interesting to see if Audi can, you know, open up, well, close in and then open up a gap. Like they did last season, obviously. But... It's, I think it's all still to play for in the team's championship, but it, it's really. I, I, I've got a feeling that it's going to be far from over. But the thing is, at the moment, if you compare Jean Eric and Andre Lodra to Lucas Degrassi and Daniel Apt, who would you say has the more consistent driver lineup right there? Uh, If you look at the 38 points, 21 points, 26 points, 31 points, 15 points, and 28 points out of the last six races from Diaz de Cheetah, you would say them. Yeah, I would agree, and that's purely because Lodera is very talented. And Daniel Apt had a very difficult season this year. Um, In season four, we saw him take two wins, three if you want to uh, talk about Hong Kong before the disqualification. This season, he hasn't really been... He's been consistently in the points. He's been consistently in the points. But he hasn't been consistent, consistently in the top three. For Audi to realistically, properly challenge DS to Cheetah, you're going to need Apt on the same level as Degrassi going into the final weekend. You're going to need a couple of one-twos. Yeah, ideally, yeah. 
end of this stage is Daniel Apt, the driver, who will get that second place. I'm going to say no. No, not at this stage, no. And he's fighting for his career at the moment, by the looks of things. Yes, well, there has been speculation about him and potentially a move or just getting out of it altogether. Um, he, I was reading something this morning, actually, on the 24th, and Rob Watts from e magazine actually spoke to uh, Daniel this weekend, and Daniel has turned around and said, if I don't get a drive with Audi, I might consider my options outside of Formula E. Mm, that's very telling. <laughs> So well, it's it's um it's going to be a massive weekend um, coming up with a double header. Yeah, it's going to be make a break for him, really. It really is. It's going to, you know a lot of these drivers putting themselves in front of the shop window um, that'll be looking to to renew their contracts or or you know another team to to be scouting them. Yeah, exactly. But the thing is with Daniel Apt, it's his surname Apt. Yes, it's a you know it's part of the team DNA, but I guess exactly. that can change. You know, it's now an Audi factory team, so yes, we will see. Um, so that's all for this episode. One more weekend of season five. One more weekend until November. You looking forward to it, Chris? I can't wait. I can't wait. I think New York's going to be fantastic. Double header race. Obviously, New York's such a cool track. You can overtake on it. It's going to be brilliant. Yeah, I can't wait. I love New York last year. It was such a good race. So well, both of them were so, so good. So yeah. They were. It's it's a great, great city, great spectacle. Um, and especially with the um, with the podium on the harbour and the ships and, you know, the fireworks. And it was just, it was just spectacular. It's, yeah, it's, it's cool. You've got, to, you've got to watch it. If you watch one race this season, tune into the finale. Yeah, I would agree because there are so many little stories going on on this grid and it's going to be a fantastic climax to what has been a fantastic season really and I uh, I can't wait to see it and you can guarantee there'll be drama because it's Formula E oh, and Formula E is just unpredictable you know Okay, so prediction who's winning? Either race. Who's winning either race? Oh, okay. Um, it's, it's 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 too much for for my my brain to sort of comprehend <laughs> who's winning what. Um, but I'm going to go with Mitch Evans. He'll take out one of them. Okay, I think that's quite a good idea. Yeah. Um, see, the thing is, this and Adams haven't won a race this year, which is surprising, really, because they've got a qualifying pace. The car's just inefficient in race conditions. And I, I would say Sebastian Buemi, but because there's so much overtaking in the New York track, I don't think that'll be the case. I don't think he'll be able to keep it behind, especially with a more inefficient car. I'm going to say Vern will win one of them. Wow, a fourth one. And, you know, Sam Bird. Boom. Sam Bird will win one of them. Yeah, it's a good shout. I'd All like right. to see Sam win one. Yeah, excellent. Okay, Motorsport Monday is an online magazine from some of the best motorsport writers on the planet. Chris is included in that list and is the Formula E editor. Uh, check that out at Motorsport Monday, uh, also Motorsport Week. Um, we love to talk with the community, so please give us an email: hello at regenracingpodcast dot com. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And I'll also be posting uh, our awesome episode artwork uh, moving forward from Huzu Graphics on those locations. The website is regenracingpodcast.com. Um, if you get a chance, uh, please give us a review and uh, a rating. It doesn't have to be five stars. But um, yeah, any feedback on the show is appreciated. And if you could do one thing, also, just tell someone about the show and just, yeah, say, hey, do you watch Formula E? Be that person. So, Chris, thank you once again. It's always a pleasure having you here and a safe trip back to the UK. Yeah, thank you very much. My flight's uh, later on today, but I have to actually check out of here in one hour. 
Right, well, we won't keep you, but again, thank you very much, and we will talk to you again soon, listeners. Well, I think you should see my room. It's a mess. I'll see you later.